All right, this is section two of, or the next section of causes of expansion for Japan from 1868 to 1930, the impact of Japanese ma nationalism and uh, mater uh, militarism on foreign policy. So this is the section that we look at the new system. As you remember from the previous lecture video, um, things changed. The samurai were no longer in charge. They, that was not the military. And they restored the emperor's power. And so now this next era is called the Meiji Restoration Era, a period of social and political change. So we have this new government structure in Japan. Uh, the Meiji era signaled the intro to a cult personality, personality that was built around an emperor. If you don't know what that word means or that phrase means cult personality, um, it's like just think of like, um, you know how some people are really obsessed with like their K-pop groups or like Beyonce or, you know, like these artists that are very talented, right? Um, and that's like they stand and like everything they do is like they can do no wrong type of stuff, right? Or to like people who are just like really obsessed with certain individuals. Think of that, but with this, but like to an intensity more intense and like the entire government is like built in that way. And so this meant that the emperor would now be seen as a divine leader of Japan, a descendant of the sun goddess, uh, and therefore he was a living god, and he's going to be worshipped and respected and seen as that throughout Japanese um, society at this point. Um, this important was emphasized in the religion Shintoism, um, uh, and where where the shrines remain through Japan. You can see one of the shrines right there on the right side. Uh, this mixed religion, the emperor worship, and nationalism into one identity. And so all of these elements are extremely important because one, religion is a very personal and important thing to people. So if you start to blend in um, your that religion within Japan with that of like the emperor, the new leadership, people start to like basically blend both of these things. And so now you have all of this massive following in Japan of religious um, individuals, right? And then nationalism is like, an intense love or devotion or loyalty to the country. And so one cannot exist without the other. Next slide. So the government has changed. The Takagawa Samurai clan, like I said in the last um, uh, lecture video, lost power. Emperor is now here. Power is restored. Um, and so also we see the capital changing. So now um, it's the capital goes from uh, Kyoto to Edo, which is now known as Tokyo. Um, the goal was to convince the population that the emperor's royal ancestors, uh, that this was not a new, a new government system, right? Um, but instead the restoration of an imperial rule. So the emperor is once again in, you know, in a leadership position in the country because prior to the, the clans and, you know, holding power, it was the emperor, but then the clans came in and replaced that system. And so now what's being told to the population of Japan. It's like, we're just going back to what we were before, our old roots. Um, and now the, the emperor is linked to the people, the common people again, and the emperor is the one ruling. Uh, next slide. Um, you can see here, right, just the representation going from the clans to the emperor, right? Next one. So with the new government system comes a new constitution. So Japan is creating its constitution. Japan um, creates a um, legislative branch and, and known, you know, the national diet, which is a bicameral system. Bicameral means like two, right? Two houses. So the national diet had two houses, the house of peers and the house of representatives. So the house of peers was made of no, uh, nobility, senior civil servants and high military officers. Um, and then the House of Representatives were people who were elected by the population, just kind of like how we have here in the United States. Um, we have the House of, you know, the Senate and the House of Representatives, but both of the Senate and the representatives here in the United States are voted in by people. But in Japan at this time, um, only the House of Representatives is voted in by the population in Japan. Uh, what is the role of this new bicameral system, the national diet, right? The, the, the uh, diet's role. Um, assisting the emperor in his decision uh, making, making, sorry, so that's their role. Uh, what was the emperor's role in this system? Okay, again, the emperor holds power, it's restored their power. So supreme law laid in the emperor's hand. This meant that above politics, above, he was meant to be above politics, sorry, but all decisions were made in his name. 
Uh, this meant that although the emperor was not expected to make political decisions because he was too good for that, that's like the vibe that they're trying to give off at this point, um, all his subjects, the population, had to be loyal to him. Um, the emperor was also expected to take advantage, uh, sorry, advice that was offered by his group of advisors, people who were very influential and in knowing of Japan's situation, government system, and everything. Um, and so that's basically the, the role that they had. But the, the, the advisors had no roles listed under the constitution, but they were the direct link from the emperor to the national diet. Um, he could veto any new law that passed. The emperor could veto any new law. That law that means just to take away, like reject a law and basically deny a law and say, no, this is not going to be the law um, if something gets passed in, in the legislative branch. Um, and then the, another thing he could do is uh, he could pass his own national laws when the national diet was not in session. And then the military was responsible to and direct you know, was responsible directly to the emperor and they swore their loyalty to, to the emperor um, and only responded to basically him mostly, right? Uh, voting, the system of voting is now changing as well. People could not vote before and now they're voting. Um, men over the age of 25 and over and over uh, who paid a certain amount of taxes were now given the right to vote. But this might seem like democracy, but it's not because because it was only 25 and over and it was only men and men who paid uh you know a certain amount of taxes it limited it to basically 1.1 1 1.14 percent of the population very small that's not really democratic that means like um, basically almost 99 percent of the rest of japan's population has no voting rights at this point um and they can only vote for the members of the national diet and that's it right um that was their only role in that sense next one in order to achieve the goal of transitioning from samurai to modern day army, a basic level of literacy was needed. So this system means, okay, we don't have the samurai anymore. We have a modern army that has guns and these uniforms and whatever, but that's not enough. You need to know how to read as a soldier, right? You need to know how to read to understand the basic orders, the new technology, all these things, and to kind of stay and compete with other militaries if the time comes when there's a conflict, right? So in order to help accomplish this, schooling was introduced in 1876, uh, but it was not free. And by 1870, uh, and by that time, only 46% of the boys attended school and 60% of the girls. Um, through schooling, though, those who did attend Japanese nationalism was taught. And, you know, basically it was the foundation of education and a lot of the subjects. And that means that these kids from a young age are being taught to love and be loyal to the emperor and Japan. And that's it. Not question. Um, the minds of Japanese kids at this time were molded so that when it came down time to go into battle, they'd be ready and willing to actually go into battle and sacrifice their lives, you know. Um, and so it was like a great honor type of stuff. Next slide. Um, when you look more specifically at the military, all men have to serve three years in the army and four years in the reserves. Um, this was argued to be the only way to defend the country, but to also unify it. So the national unity was, ar was armed unity, national education was military education type of stuff, right? Um, the armed forces swore loyalty to, like I said, to the emperor only, that's it. No flag, no nothing, just the emperor. Soldiers were recruited in large numbers and taught to only obey the emperor and their nation, and that's it. Any deviation from that was basically treason, right? You're, you're dishonoring your country. And they were not allowed to express any political opinions, even in private. Even if, like, you're just casually saying, like, you know, I agree with this policy or I don't agree with this policy. Even if you're just saying that you're about that's discouraged, you're not allowed to. Next slide. Uh, plans for expansion and imperialism. So this is one of the most important things that Japan is basically shifting towards now that this new system. It's like, well, we're going to modernize and we're going to industrialize, but we also have to expand to kind of basically if we're going to be a power, we need land, right? Because land is power. Um, and you'll see that theme reoccurring over and over again throughout this semester. With the establishment of a loyal military, Japan began to look for opportunities to expand and control more territory. They did this for a, a number of reasons. One, to elevate its status of an imperial power. Um, two, 
to uh, second one to access resources for a government population, and three to basically secure territory that might otherwise fall in the control of their uh, other powers. So again, if you are expanding and you are taking over regions, you have power, you have influence as well, and people are intimidated by you because you were able to take over these regions, right? Um, and to and you know. When you take over those reason, re regions, you're taking over the resources of those regions as well, very valuable resources. So you're going to see in the next few lectures that Japan has its eyes on certain regions that offer land for their people, growing population, and resources that could be used to feed their people. And also, you don't want those regions to fall in under the your, your rivals, other powers, because you're trying to be like them, and if they're taking everything, you can't be like them right? So that's what we see with Japan. This is where we're going to end it today. Um, we'll see more in the next few slides. Thank you.